All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome back. <laughs> Let's, uh, my name is Lan, uh, Bo Lan Zhi. Let's move on to uh, panel three on social bonding. We have three distinguished uh, scholars here. Uh, Professor Sarah Friedman from University of Indiana, Professor Robert Weller from Boston University, and Professor Penny Edwards, uh, UC Berkeley. We also have a discussion from Taiwan, Professor Zhao from Donghai University. OK, uh, we have a very tight schedule. So <laughs> let's get started. Uh, let's welcome Professor Sarah Friedman. What do I do with this? Now you can hear me? OK. I just had to push. Um, so I am going to be talking about a subject that Professor Tian mentioned this morning, cross-strait marriages. Um, since 1987 to the present, there have been roughly 300,000 uh, cross-strait marriages. Uh, where couples have actually established residence in Taiwan. And approximately 95, give or take, percent of Chinese spouses in Taiwan are women. So in my chapter for our edited volume, I look at governmental and societal responses to these marriages and to the growing presence in Taiwan of mainland Chinese who are both part of Taiwanese families and eligible for Taiwanese citizenship. Precisely because of the contested political relationship across the strait, these Chinese spouses occupy what I call an ex exceptional status in Taiwan as neither foreigners nor natives. And they face lengthier and more demanding immigration and naturalization requirements than all other foreign spouses in Taiwan. So in other words, despite thinking about them as sharing ethnic and racial features, as well as cultural values and social norms with Taiwanese, they're treated more stringently than obviously, quote unquote, foreign marital immigrants, in part because of concerns that their more visible similarities with Taiwanese may in fact obscure important differences in political outlook and marital motivations. So as various Taiwanese governments over <clears throat> the last two decades have sought to manage these familial flows across the strait, they've developed what I call a dependency model of marital immigration. And this model ties a Chinese wife or husband's legal standing in Taiwan exclusively to their family and marital status. At the heart of this model is a gender ideal of feminized domesticity, that values Chinese spouses' reproductive contributions to their families and views their desire to engage in non-domestic labor outside the home as suspect, in other words, as potential signs of dubious marital motives on the part of an immigrant spouse. So in my chapter, I first look at how this dependency model, what I call dependency model, is promulgated through immigration policies and government propaganda. And then I examine how different groups of Chinese women and men in Taiwan struggle with norms of patrilineality, of descent through a male descent line, and patriarchy that are embedded in this model, and the gender role expectations they face as a result from both family members and from bureaucrats who adjudicate their immigrant status. Now, I should say here that I'm less interested in documenting empirical differences in gender roles, and ideologies across the strait, since these are going to necessarily vary over both time and context. And I'm more concerned with showing how the concept of gender is mobilized discursively by immigrants, citizens, and bureaucrats, as well as in immigration policies, in ways that expose fundamental tensions surrounding patrilineal family ideals and their concomitant gender roles in this context of globalization and transnational migration. This pervasive discourse of gender ideologies does important work, I want to suggest here, by providing a register through which cross-strait political differences and the diverse forms of socialization being reared in different systems um, they engender may be discussed, managed, and potentially neutralized to make them less threatening to intimate domains of marriage, family, and the nation. Now, in the longer version, I talk about why 
um, attention to gender is important in these kinds of migration contexts, precisely because gender expectations shape the subjective identities and experiences of migrants, as well as the kinds of immigration and naturalization policies they face. Gender is prominent in official discourses and official policies, even though it might be masked by gender neutral language, such as now the use of spouse in Taiwan policies, as well as in societal responses to migration that emanate from both sending and receiving countries. In the case of marital migration from China to Taiwan, I argue we need to add to this picture the work that gender discourses do in a context of cross-strait political conflict and tension over Taiwan's sovereign status. Talk about gender expectations and inequalities operates in many ways to shape policies, treatment by social service providers, norms of femininity and masculinity, as well as the identities and personal aspirations of immigrants and their citizen spouses. And I want to add here that although this language of official language of marital immigration in Taiwan is gender neutral now, it actually encodes a gender binary that foregrounds femininity and cloaks masculinity in a veil of invisibility. And I'm going to show how this functions um, specifically for Chinese men in Taiwan and how they deal with some of the gendered expectations in this model. Now, one could say that family ties have long served as a metaphor for different visions of Taiwan and China's contemporary relationship. Um, this recent wave of cross-strait marriages, however, adds new complexity to these configurations of kinship and political unity by showing how intimate ties may in fact harden perceptions of differences across the strait. The gender discourses that I examine reveal profound disillusionment about the possibility of happy reunions, exposing in turn the compromises and the hard work that's necessary to resolve both everyday and bureaucratic forms of contestation. Now, I don't want to suggest that all cross-strait marriages are unhappy ones. And in fact, there are many couples who do build fulfilling family lives despite their differences. But by for focusing on points of contention, I want to expose some of the key gendered assumptions that underlie official state immigration policies and Taiwanese norms of social interaction, while also showing how individual migrants negotiate these conflicts in their everyday lives um, as marital immigrants in Taiwan. So just brief uh, overview of the history of recent cross-strait marriages, um, beginning obviously in 1987 with the resumption of uh, ties and the ability on the part of Taiwanese to travel to China. Many of these early marriages involved elderly veterans in Taiwan um, who had come with the Nationalist Army, some of whom had never married, others who were divorced or widowed. And these were men who were mostly looking for middle-aged women who would take care of them as they aged in Taiwan, given that they did not have other kinds of extended family support. But this, um, these marriages rapidly diversified uh, over time to encompass a much wider range of populations on both, side of, both sides of the straits. Um, you see middle-aged and younger men in Taiwan, some of whom are disadvantaged on the marriage market because of disability, because of poor economic prospects, complex family arrangements, um, who marry women from a diversity of backgrounds from China some of whom are marrying for the first time, some of whom are divorced. Um, and then increasingly, as more and more Taiwanese are living in the mainland, you see couples who are closer in age, closer in educational background, who meet through the workplace, uh, through education, um, or through introductions. So we see a much more diverse picture of these marriages, and increasingly also um, unions that involve Chinese men and Taiwanese women. Now, despite a growing number of these marriages, official government responses to them have differed quite dramatically. So from the Chinese side, there's been much less um, monitoring regulation concern, in large part because out-migration from China accounts for less than 1% of all marriages per year since um, reform and opening. So statistically, it's not a very large number. On the Taiwan side, however, the picture is quite different. Um, so in Taiwan, you have a very different demographic picture of um, declining rates of domestic marriage coupled with um, 
declining birth rates among the local population, as well as growing numbers of marriages with a non-Taiwanese, um, both women from Southeast Asia and from mainland China. So demographically, in Taiwan, in addition to the political complexity, there's also greater concern about the social impact of these marriages and the children that they might produce. Okay, I'm gonna skip over some. So all marital immigrants to Taiwan face an immigration regime that firmly links their ability to remain legally in the country to their marital status for the entire pre-naturalization period. Now prior to 2009, Chinese spouses had to wait twice as long as all other foreign spouses before they became eligible for citizenship, typically a minimum of eight years as opposed to four years. Um, and this time frame was reduced uh, to six years in 2009 with uh, an initiative to equalize treatment by Ma ying -jiu. Now, unlike foreign spouses who receive residency status and work rights immediately upon arrival in Taiwan, again, prior to 2009, Chinese spouses faced a delay of t several years in obtaining residency. It varied based on circumstances. And legal work rights could take from two to six years, also depending on individual circumstances. This situation was equalized as well in the summer of 2009. And now, upon arrival, all Chinese spouses get residency and legal work rights. To progress towards naturalization and preserve their legal standing in Taiwan, all marital immigrants require support from their Taiwanese husbands or family members uh, who serve as their guarantor. And there are multiple ways that a citizen spouse can derail this process if he or she desires. For Chinese spouses, the extended time to citizenship and the requirement that they progress through multiple residency stages, which requires paperwork and appearing, um, the, that their guarantor appear uh, at National Immigration Agency offices. This longer time frame and complexity actually puts them at greater risk that something might go awry at any step in the process. Uh, all, st all stages require that the Chinese spouse remain married to the same person, with only a few exceptions that are premised on having born a Taiwanese child primarily. So in other words, during the entire pre-naturalization period, Chinese spouses can only maintain a legal status in Taiwan through a dependent relationship with their spouse or in exceptional cases with a child. They can never form an independent or direct relationship with the state or make individual claims to belonging. So in the longer paper, I look at some of the ways that this dependency model is um, promoted by the government, and I look in particular at a uh, promotional video that was put out by the Mainland Affairs Council in the summer of 2009 um, that served as a vehicle for promoting some of those new policy revisions that were to take effect that summer. And it encouraged greater societal acceptance of more open policies towards Chinese spouses, in part through enacting this dependency model that emphasized Chinese women's reprodu reproductive capacities over their productive ones and celebrating their feminized domestic roles as wives and mothers in Taiwanese families. And for time constraints, I'm not going to talk more about that, but I have the video if anybody wants to see. <laughs> OK. So in the. Um, body of the paper, I look at three different kinds of um, responses then to this dependency model and the gendered assumptions embedded in it on the part of three groups of Chinese spouses. The first are younger women, um, many of whom are marrying for the first time when they come to Taiwan, although not exclusively. And here I look at expressions of disappointment on their part with how their marriages have turned out in terms of expectations that they fulfill more traditional gender roles within the family, that they bear sole responsibility for housework and other domestic tasks, and for what they describe as Taiwanese men's quote unquote patriarchal tendencies. They contrast this then with presumed gender egalitarianism in the mainland um, and talk often of mainland men's willingness to do housework um, sometimes above and beyond that of their wives. They also chafe against um, restrictions on work outside the home, both legal restrictions and restrictions imposed by their Taiwanese families, um, in contrast to expectations among their generation in China that both spouses 
would work and help support the family. So in these conversations, you see that women have a facility with the language of gender. They actually use terms such as patriarchal or gender egalitarian, and that they deploy this language to great effect in expressing their marital frustrations specifically. But at the same time, this isn't an absolute picture, right? We can't say automatically, based on these kinds of comments, that, oh, Taiwan is more patriarchal, China is more gender egalitarian. These are also coupled with portrayals of Taiwanese men as being more caring, cultured, cultivated than mainland men, um, and that they offer better communication skills and are more willing to perform affective labor, even if they're not willing to perform housework. So these contrasts show the malleability of gender discourses. Um, and, and what I'm trying to say here is what, what's at stake is not empirical differences that would be very hard to measure, but um, how gender is mobilized in these commentaries on cross-strait marriages. What kind of work gender talk does, in other words. And this is very striking if we turn to look at middle-aged and older Chinese women. And here's a group born roughly between the 1930s and early 1960s, many of whom marry elderly veterans in Taiwan in what are now known in bureaucratic circles as quote-unquote caretaking marriages. Um, so these women stand out in Taiwan more for their dress, their manner of speaking, uh, their forms of social interaction, and they're seen as sharp talkers whose verbal skills and more confrontational styles of social interaction were honed through years of cultural revolution experience and struggle. But again, this image of a forceful female persona is also combined with the caretaking ideal that's promoted in policies. So women also emphasize their commitment to caring for their elderly husbands, um, and they downplay their desire to work and earn money. Um, and this also produces quite significant tensions for them because they do, most of them have existing family commitments in China. And part of sometimes part of their reason for coming to Taiwan is greater income generating opportunities. So let me turn, since I'm running out of time, just briefly to the third case, which are Chinese men. And here we find a very interesting um, similarities and differences with the responses from women. Right. So language of policy is gender neutral. Men experience the same opportunities and restrictions that women do. Um, and yet they are much more hesitant to overtly acknowledge the gender dimensions of their immigration experiences. Um, these gender dimensions get underscored in interesting ways. One is through language. So the ma, um, verbs used to describe gendered marriage patterns in a patrilineal system, men, qu, and women, jia. Um, one way of underscoring men's more feminized position as marital immigrants is to describe them as ni ye shi jia dao taiwan lai de. So you've also married out into Taiwan. Um, and I look at how men try to refute that gendered portrayal of themselves. So most Chinese men in Taiwan struggle with these assumptions of feminized domesticity and dependence that are embedded in immigration policies. So if they do benefit, say, from exceptions in the law um, due to having a child with their Taiwanese spouse, they are more likely to describe this simply as a coincidence, um, to downplay the extent to which gender affects their own um, sense of masculinity possibility, um, as well as shaping their own immigration experiences. And I'll just say briefly that for Chinese men who have higher education and professional employment, they're more likely to remain in China and to ask their wives to move to China. And for them, the possibility of moving to Taiwan is even less conceivable, I might say. So let me just conclude. Despite the gender neutral language of these marital immigration and naturalization policies, both Chinese wives and husbands in Taiwan recognize the gendered principles of feminized domesticity and dependency that undergird these policies. At the same time, they respond to these principles very differently, women openly acknowledging their impact on their lives, while men enjoy the privilege of denying or minimizing their status as gendered subjects. When they are confronted with the ways that immigrant standing undermines their male privilege, they often seek to shift the terrain of discussion from gender inequalities and kinship status to national identity. 
thereby reclaiming their own gender privilege by erasing gender from any overt discussions of nation or citizenship. Now, you can look comparatively at different kinds of laws that regulate cross-border mobility and find that these contemporary immigration policies are not unique in generating an effect of gender dependency. Uh, Taiwan's nationality law um, would be another, guojifa, would be another place to look for this. Nor does gender neutral language, uh, such as spouse, necessarily produce gender egalitarian policies. Um, in effect, gendered expectations of dependency, domesticity, and caretaking that underlie definitions of authentic marriages in Taiwan um, obscure their effects by framing them in gender neutral language. And state officials and bureaucrats play an important role in this erasure by embedding the emphasis on gendered kinship roles and patrilineality in government practices that are ostensibly based on objectivity and rational interest. So in the case of cross-trait marriages, I'm suggesting that conflicts over gender ideologies, role expectations, constitute an important means through which political concerns and tensions may legitimately be expressed and potentially neutralized. Defining Chinese wives and husbands as kin dependents who are embedded in patrilineal families channel channels political tensions into discourses of proper gender roles and authentic marital behaviors. This deflection itself may produce unintended consequences, however, by hardening perceptions of cross-strait differences, even in these intimate relationships, and underscoring the powerful linkages, albeit differently construed, between intimate life and state regulation on both sides of the Taiwan Strait. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Professor Weber. Am I live? I'm live. It's a relief to know. Um, I, I was assigned to be the religion guy in this cross-strait exercise here, anthropology afternoon of the cross-straits. Um, for me, the initial thing that's striking about religion on both sides of the strait is how much things have changed during the 30 years I've been looking at such things. Uh, religiosity on Taiwan has probably increased and certainly changed in nature to a significant extent over that period. And most striking of all is the rise of those gigantic Buddhist groups that probably all of you are aware of. The changes on the mainland, of course, are far more striking. We go from a religiosity level of something close to zero 30 years ago uh, to an amazing blossoming of religion of all kinds. Temple religion come back, uh, Confucianism, if we want to count that, at least in some circles, Christianity above all, um, but Buddhism to some extent as well. Um, so the question for me is why? And why, given a hundred years almost uh, of political difference, why do the two situations actually look so much alike? And to answer the question, I want to look at three kinds of cross-straits effects. The first one is um, global. And by that, I mean the things that don't flow from Taiwan to China or from China to Taiwan, but the pressures that come from elsewhere in the world and affect both sides of the strait, put pressures on both sides of the strait. That doesn't mean either side would react in any particular way, but that they feel pressures to which they must respond in some way. The second one I want to talk about is the kind of direct tie that most of the papers at this conference deal with. That is the actual movement of people and objects from one side of the strait to the other side of the strait. And as you'll see, and as with most of the other topics people talk about, it's mostly from Taiwan to the mainland, and, and then in these cases back to Taiwan. And the third one is the flow of uh, not necessarily people or objects, but just of information. And in particular, what I want to talk about are what we might call exemplary um, movements across the strait. That is, cases where, uh, again, it's mostly from Taiwan to China, but where China is looking at Taiwan policies or Taiwan organizational methods and saying, we can imitate that that here's an idea that we can use. So a, a yet another kind of flow. So let me start with the global influences and let me go back, let me go way, way, way far back for an anthropologist 
that is like 100 years back to talk about that because there was really important transformations in Chinese religion that occurred because of a major global um, push, in this case out from the West, and that's the push of the idea of secularization. And here I don't mean secularization as de-religionization or something like that. I don't mean a decline in religiosity or spirituality. I mean the separation of religion from the rest of society, politics, and life in general. Um, in particular, separation of church and state. Um, and you'll note that as soon as we get a Republic of China, we get a constitution modeled after um, Western versions of separations of church and state. So it's written in right from the beginning. And it means you have to do things like define what a religion is. When you don't exactly have a concept or you just barely have a word in Chinese, zongjiao, which is one of those Japanese translations of European words that come into China right around this time because you need it in order to set up these kinds of um, legal things. So the idea of religion is really created at this point, as is the idea of secular, right? You don't get the one without the other. So this process is really important, and it's really important on both sides of the strait. That is, a Japanese Taiwan at this time and a, um, a newly KMT China, Chinese mainland, at this time. In both places, we get a kind of corporatist structure to control things that are recognized as religions. We get a marginalization of things that are no longer recognized as religions. Confucianism is out. I won't really be talking about that. But more important for my purposes, temple religion, temple worship, whatever we want to call that, is out. It does not fit anybody's definition of religion, and it's marginalized. Um, becomes a kind of extra legal thing, sometimes ignored and ridiculed a bit, uh, and sometimes actively repressed, actually, in both, in both Taiwan and on the mainland. This is before the communists. And in both cases, we also get a deintegration of religion and society. So the, the way in which, for instance, in Taiwan, every social organization in the late Qing and the early years of the 20th century was set up not every social organization, but many social organizations were set up as God-worshipping societies, shen uh, minhui. Trade associations were set up that way. Lineages in some parts of um, uh, China were set up that way. Uh, that is not as just ancestral halls with tablets in them, but as God-worshipping associations. This ends as a, as a recognized legal form. It ends on both sides of the strait. All right, so that's number one, and it's a major transformation of religion, um, in, in Taiwan and China both. The second I want to mention, let me call it the Cold War because we have lots of Cold War-y sorts of papers, Michael's most obviously maybe, but, but uh, the idea keeps coming up. The Cold War, of course, kind of changes global flows like this. And you know, as you might expect for some things, and religiosity is certainly one of them, it divorces the two global flows. So we get a, um, now a very different set of pressures in China uh, on the mainland than we get in Taiwan. So in Taiwan, now a KMT Taiwan, right? We have um, more or less a continuation of the Republican period on the mainland. Corporatist control of religion, there are only 10 of them that are recognized. Um, um, at best, making fun of uh, local temple practices. At worst, uh, arresting spirit mediums or, or, or uh, preventing temples from holding rituals. Uh, and on the mainland in the 1950s, actually not so very different. But once we get into the 60s, a different understanding of religion starts to become more dominant. That is, religion not the way Marx mostly talked about it, which is something these poor oppressed people need as an escape from the world, a heart in a heartless world, but rather something nasty and evil that needs to be stamped out. And so it's a very different attitude. And we really start to see this in the socialist education movement, 64, 65, and then even more strongly and more broadly in the Cultural Revolution, where open religiosity of almost any sort is just ruled out. So this is where we start to see Taiwan and, and mainland China looking utterly different from a religious perspective. And then we get the 80s, and the 80s bring a, a total transformation on both sides of the strait, although obviously with rather different mechanisms. In, um, so the Cold War ends in this decade. Um, that's one kind of a difference. Taiwan democratizes. That makes a huge difference. 
and it does it in several ways. So democratization in Taiwan means the end of corporatist control over religion, and that's directly related to the rise of these Buddhist groups. Right? They're no longer under the thumb, although they existed already. They really expand only in the 1980s, no longer under the thumb of the Buddhist Association of the Republic of China. Um, some sectarian religion that had been illegal, most importantly, Yi Guan Dao, is made legal. And as soon as it's made legal and is now r shows up on censuses of uh, religious membership, it becomes a gigantic religion larger than Christianity, r larger than all combined Christianity in Taiwan. Um, and then the rise of these Buddhist groups, as I just said, that's also in this decade. And uh, temples, temples from being something that politicians scoffed at and ridiculed um, become places where politicians have to go and burn incense, right? Even clearly not religious people are now showing up all the time at temples burning incense. And that, you know, at the beginning, before the environmentalists got going, they were chopping off chicken heads and things to make their political promises. Um, so that's that, a real change just in the level of that in popular discourse. China, we go from almost no open religiosity to this boom, you know, to parts of uh, Fujian that look like Taiwan, you know, just for density of temples and vivacity of rituals. Again, you can see rituals with, uh, you know, giant temple fairs with 50,000 people, 100,000 people showing up at them. Um, you know, amazing kinds of things going on. Christianity completely booming, mostly in an unofficial way. And again, most of this action is, I don't want to say illegal, but extra legal, right? There is no proper legal position for it, but a huge change. And just as, you know, kind of global influences on both of these at this time now that it's opened up in both places, um, we have what, uh, what in many places that are rapidly moving into a commercial economy, doing very well in some ways, but, but undermining many of the older ways of living is an image of a moral crisis. It's very common in the developing world as it was in Europe earlier. And religion is one of the responses to this feeling that there's a moral crisis. Some religion responds by saying, yes, the market is great and um, believe in God and you too shall get rich. Right? Prosperity, Christianity, uh, right? The gospel of prosperity. This is one version of that, but there are other, there are other versions of it that I, I won't talk about. The ghost cult that I wrote about earlier uh, some years ago in Taiwan was very much this kind of a thing. But the more common thing is to say markets are good because they pay. That's how we religions have an income. Um, but they're inherently unfair. They're not moral. They're maybe not immoral, but they're amoral and they leave a huge moral gap in society, and somebody has to step in and fill this gap. This is an important Christian line. It was the Christian line in the 19th century that really led to the international NGO movement, things like the Red Cross, um, uh, and it's behind a, a lot of the rhetoric of these new Buddhist movements in Taiwan as well. So that's one era where, area where we see a kind of global um, change that affects both sides of the strait. So suddenly we, ha we have religion setting up NGOs that are, that are intimately involved in charitable work. Uh, um, so we have the, sorry, the crisis of wealth. The second one is this idea of charity and that NGOs, that private organizations, including religious ones, should be carrying the weight of social welfare. This is again a 1980s Reagan-Thatcher um, vision of how government is supposed to work. And it's one that has a very strong effect all over the world. If you look at figures of international NGOs, they skyrocket. Um, starting in this period. And neither Taiwan nor um, China is immune from that effect. It, you really see it strongly in both and religious organizations intimately involved. All right, let me turn to the second um, form of cross-straits relations, if you let me use the word a little loosely, and that's direct contact. And let me start with the obvious uh, pilgrimage. So as soon as you could start going back to the mainland, Taiwanese temples start arranging pilgrimages back to the mother temples from which they branched on the mainland. And so we see groups of hundreds of people, very often thousands of people, occasionally making the trip across the strait one way or the other, visiting and bringing back incense or sometimes images from um, home temples. From the point of view of Taiwan temples, 
that had several advantages. One, of course, was it was it was something they always used to do, but hadn't been able to do for a very long time. So there's simply a kind of renewal of the cosmic power of the temple that you get, a, an expression of local piety. Um, but also connections to those temples are part of the claim to priority that temples have within Taiwan. That is, when one Manzu temple is completing with another Manzu temple in Taiwan for spiritual power, it's that connection to the mother temple in Meizhou that's critical to them. And making the pilgrimage back was a way of changing the hierarchy of temples within Taiwan, or at least arguing about the hierarchy of temples within Taiwan. More puzzling is why cadres in those mainland towns would have allowed this. Not allowed this, but encouraged this, right? So this is, this is an interesting question. Now, sometimes those cadres are local guys who grew up burning incense to these things, but sometimes they're not. I mean, all of us who work in China have run into cadres that are really seriously anti-religious people. They really do think it's stupid and superstitious and harmful. And yet, they're allowing this to take place. Why? Because of everything else that might come with it. Taiwanese investment, in particular. Business investment, infrastructure investment. You're coming to this temple, we need a better road. You're all coming over, what are we going to do about medical care? Donate for a hospital. Right? And this kind of negotiation happened all over. Right, but we have other exchanges, too. I, I need 20 minutes is not a lot of minutes. Uh, <laughs> I need to go kind of quickly here. But there's exchange of knowledge that goes like this, too. Texts, um, temple texts about gods going both ways across the, the strait. Scholars, especially as religion has become legitimate in China by being folklorized, the, the um, utilization and mobilization of scholars as part of the argument has become really important. So that includes Taiwan scholars being brought to the mainland to provide a kind of not quite international, but better than domestic legitimacy to what people are doing. Monks going back and forth, missionaries going back and forth. Um, all of that is quite important. I'd also note, uh, and I'll come back to this in the conclusion, this forges an interesting kind of identity, right? So we, we often assume that more contact means more pressure for unity. But you know what kind of identity is created through these contacts? It's not a Chinese ident identity, particularly. It's a local identity. You know, when, when the place I first lived, Sanxia in Taipei Xian, when those Zhu Shi Gong Miao goes back to Anxi Xian, that's a connection between Anxi Xian and Sanxia Zhen. It's not a connection between anybody else. Even when the Mazu people go back, it's a, maybe it's a southern Min identity or a Min, a, you know, a Da Min Guo identity or something like that. It's not a Chinese identity particularly. All right, so let me, let me come back to that point at the end. Really quickly, the, the third kind of thing, the exemplary effects, let me suggest uh, just two, I guess. Um, one is Taiwan had a policy where temples had to register but didn't under the authoritarian period. Um, where religion was really discouraged, but in fact allowed to be practiced. A kind of hands-off, let's pretend we don't know what's going on as long as you don't make too much trouble sort of policy. That's exactly what's going on in China now. Have they actually looked at what Taiwan did? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. It could be that um, it's one of few solutions to a, a policy problem that both places faced, and they came up with the same answer. I don't know, but that, that's a possibility. More obvious is something like the influence of those big Buddhist groups um, in China. So if you ask religious NGOs in China, what, what are their main influences? What, who are they trying to be like? They usually answer with one or both of two organizations. One is the Amity Foundation, a Christian NGO in China with close government connections and connections to the official Protestant church there. And the other one is Tsuji, uh, the gigantic Taiwanese Buddhist group, uh, directly imitated by some major uh, temples, Buddhist temples in China. Nan Putoshan, for instance, in Xiamen, is really modeling itself on Tsuji, but many others in informal ways as well. All right, let me conclude before I get too many more little pieces of paper passed, <laughs> passed this way. Um, uh, the, you know, the first thing I think we learn from looking at something like religion is this really doesn't have much to do with most of our discussion of cross straits that we see in the literature, which is about political unification or disunification or military uh, competition across the straits or these kinds of issues. Not much of this is directly involved in any of this, nor does this increase in contact, which is undoubtedly taking place, 
nor does that necessarily lead us to think that we'll get increasing political unity. So first, as I was mentioning earlier, all of these ties are local. All of these ties are local. Um, but second, all of these religions, even temple, village temple religion, are transnational in how they're organized. So you find Southeast Asian communities worshiping all these same deities that Taiwanese communities or Fujian communities are worshiping. They're translocal in that sense. Buddhism is, of course, a dedicatedly unplaced religion, right? It, it is a universalist religion. Christianity, another universalist um, religion. Now, can you construct them as national religions? Yeah, Thailand and Buddhism, Hungary and Catholicism, right? We can think of cases um, where this happens, but it's not easy. And I think it's particularly not easy in China where, you know, for a thousand years we haven't had a tradition of constructing a national religion in China. It's not easy. It's much easier to construct local identities or regional identities out of these resources or global identities out of these resources. So uh, again, I don't see this leading to a vision of a Chinese identity, although uh, nor does it particularly create an image of a Taiwanese identity. It's something else, something more complicated and interesting is going on there. Um, but finally, I'd say these things are important as all these kinds of things we're talking about that aren't the usual political and military ones, partly because they simply bring people together. They get people face to face having to solve problems together. What should be the parade route, you know, as we bring our Mazu image through Meizhou town, right? These kinds of issues have to be solved. People deal with each other. They, they deal with each other as, you know, people finding rooms for the night or all, all, all the issues of real life that have to be solved. And it's there. There's that kind of diplomacy without the diplomats, right? The real contacts of real people that happen all the time in the business community, yes, but also far outside the business community. Um, those will be crucial as whatever develops, develops. I would say, again, I don't see any of this necessarily leading toward political unity, but increasing the odds of peace, yeah, maybe. Um, and then secondly, I think it's important to recognize that there are real effects on Chinese practice from looking at Taiwanese religion. The most obvious are groups like Fu Guangshan, which is quite active on the mainland, Ciji, which has just since that Sichuan earthquake been allowed to organize branches, um, in China, but also all the demonstration effects that we have from those groups, and, and a China that's currently desperately looking for policy on religion, knowing that its current policy doesn't work, and desperately looking around for something to do, Taiwan is an example that uh, I'm certain they're looking at. All right, I got my, my last piece of paper. I give my remaining 14 seconds to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's move on to our, the third pre presenter, Professor Penny Edwards. Thank you. Um, thank you, Robert and Sarah, <laughs> both hard acts to follow. Um, but as I was listening to Robert talking and using the example of the ways in which um, temples have emerged from a site that was castigated as defunct, you know, from the anti-superstition movement, I guess, um, launched by the Kuomintang in around 1927 um, in China. Um, to their sort of movement through various um, transformations. Um, and the anecdote that you told about their political capital now being so great um, that politicians would go to them and cut off chickens' heads um, reminded me of um, when I was in Cambodia uh, in 1992 to 1993. I was working for the United Nations in Cambodia for the United Nations Transitional Authority. Um, and I had several sort of functions as a Khmer expert in the Information Education Division. And one of them was outreach to the Cambodian population and voter education. Another, by dint of my Chinese background, uh, background in Chinese studies rather, um, was outreach to ethnic Chinese communities uh, in Cambodia to make sure that they were uh, participating uh, in the political process in the elections that were then held uh, in 1993. Um, and in a sort of both contexts, um, on a visit to uh, Kompong Jam, a wealthy province uh, in Cambodia, it was drawn to my attention uh, by Cambodian Buddhists um, that Chinese military observers, um, and this was the first United Nations um, peacekeeping mission where China uh, had actually supplied uh, an engineering 
um, battalion and um, Chinese military observers as part of a process to move towards a, a peaceful end to the conflict that had ravaged Cambodia for some 20 years uh, and in which China had at times played a major part. Uh, but to get back to the story, uh, I was told that um, locals were uh, upset because uh, Chinese um, military um, observers, I think it was, uh, had um, taken over part of the monastery and were cutting chickens. It was just interesting because in, in Theravada Buddhism, you, you just don't do that. Um, so anyway, and then I sort of got in trouble with the Chinese embassy for finding this report, um, bringing it to the attention that it wasn't necessarily a good thing. Um, and I just sort of had that flashback, but also perhaps I was thinking along the lines of my paper being somewhat of a headless chicken, um, as you will no doubt <laughs> <laughs> soon find. Um, so what I want to do um, with this paper uh, is to focus on an element of the paper that I did rework since our last conference. Um, and that was to look at some of uh, the recent scholarship on soft power power in Southeast Asia uh, and China's use of soft power. Um, and I want to say that um, I work on Cambodia principally. I also work on Burma. Uh, this paper focuses primarily on Cambodia. Um, and in the longer paper, which I will spare you, um, but I will read uh, short sections from it, um, I make the point uh, that Cambodia is a useful case study uh, through which to explore the ways in which um, cross-straits relations in the broadest sense of what has at times been a, a highly um, high-pitched, rather, and, and um, aggressively pitched ideological battle um, to um, a competition and contest, if you like, for um, ownership uh, of and custodianship of cultural authenticity. And at times in this process, uh, Taiwan uh, has seemed and has emerged as a site where, uh, having been spared the Cultural Revolution, uh, these sorts of practices um, that Robert was just talking about have actually sort of been contained. Uh, and so that in the resuscitation of Chinese culture in Cambodia as elsewhere in Southeast Asia, um, it's quite probable, and I should just add that what was running through my mind too at the time was that when I was uh, traveling through Cambodia in 1992 to 93 extensively, and again in 95 um, for a, a wide ethnographic survey of Chinese communities, I came across uh, a number of Taiwanese um, missionaries there too. Um, and it's, it's, it's a very porous environment in which to operate. Um, so why is um, Cambodia of interest? Uh, it's of interest in particular because it's, it went through three uh, very stark regime shifts, um, actually four or five, uh, but from 1954 to 1970, um, pretty much neutral under Sihanouk. Um, it's of interest because by that point, um, there were vibrant Chinese communities uh, across Cambodia, uh, many centered in the capital, Phnom Penh, uh, in Battambong, uh, another wealthy uh, provincial capital or uh, key town, uh, but also um, spread throughout uh, the countryside. And there was a high degree of tolerance for the expression of Chinese cultural um, identity and a major site for the expression of that Chinese cultural identity uh, was temples and schools. And by the 1940s in Southeast Asia, in Thailand, uh, Cambodia, and elsewhere, um, schools had been set up by uh, the five main dialect groups, and they were dialect-based uh, schools. Uh, they taught in the dialects uh, of the primary components of the Nanyang Chinese, or Chinese who had migrated uh, throughout centuries uh, for various uh, reasons, uh, and settled in um, Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand, and elsewhere. Um, by the 1940s, uh, some of these uh, schools were openly identifying uh, as Guomindang, uh, and I was as not, uh, but following 1946, um, then, then there was a reluctance perhaps um, with the expulsion uh, of the Guomindang um, to claim that Guomindang identity. And you did see in Thailand um, um, a sort of a decline in the number of schools that openly identified uh, with the Guomindang party. Um, in the 1950s and 60s, um, Taiwanese um, teachers, teachers from Taiwan uh, and from mainland China, uh, were active in these schools in the provision of education in the various language groups. Um, and I'm going to show a few images at the end of this talk. Um, but I want to just focus in this section of the paper, and if there's any specific questions uh, about aspects of the ways in which um, cultural, the transmission of Chineseness uh, functioned uh, as a site for a thought of the establishment, if you like, of a, a broader claim to um, 
I guess, a sort of deterritorialized sovereignty, which is a horrible word, but um, a sort of a, a sense of, you know, yes, we are the people uh, to whom you can look for the preservation of your Chinese culture. Um, and I want to start by looking at some recent uh, scholarship on soft power uh, in Cambodia in its relations with China and its manifestations. Before I do so, I want to um, run through quickly uh, a few key statistics, um, namely that by 1970, uh, the vibrant uh, ethnic Chinese community uh, that had formed and crystallized over the previous, particularly over the previous 50 to 60 years, um, and had uh, become uh, a culturally distinct uh, community uh, in its temples, schools, associations, newspapers, medias, education, um, many of, in fact, the sites um, that um, Professor Tian Hong Mao mentioned earlier as now being sort of strands for some of these um, integration effects that are taking place in China-Taiwan relations, in cross-strait relations, um, that these, um, I, so sorry, I've just completely lost that thread of thought, but I'm sure it will return to me. Okay, so let me, um, oh, the, what I was going to say is by 1970, um, there was a shift in power and the establishment of a uh, republic um, led by Lon Nol that was firmly, uh, firmly pro-American and anti-communist. Uh, Chinese schools were very quickly brandished as suspect. There was a closure throughout Cambodia of schools and newspapers and a vilification of Chinese-ness, which saw the conflation of Chinese-ness uh, with communist uh, identity and ideals. Um, 1975 to 79, the Khmer Rouge were in power, uh, a radical uh, communist regime uh, abolished uh, all signs of ethnic difference other than Khmerness. Again, uh, Chinese language and identity suppressed. 1979, uh, Khmer Rouge ousted by a Vietnam-backed um, resistance faction. Um, Chinese language and identity again suppressed until 1991. So 1970 to 1991, for various geopolitical reasons, um, Chinese language was suppressed and the population uh, of Chinese in Cambodia fell from an estimated 400,000 in 1970 to 200,000 in 1991. Following the Paris peace agreements um, and the normalization and ex acceptance of the newly formed Cambodian government, its um, um, reparticipation uh, as uh, a seat holder in the United Nations and from then on to the present, um, there's been an absolutely astonishing transformation and renaissance of religious, cultural, and educational identification. And as somebody who witnessed this at first hand, uh, both in 92 to 93, in its very, very early ages, in 91, in fact, very early stages, in 91, when I first visited Cambodia, um, people would not take Chinese names. There were no Chinese shop signs. And I did manage to you know, use my Mandarin uh, in the marketplace through Sino-Vietnamese who had come into Cambodia to conduct business. It's a very different story now. The story now is that many Cambodians are actively participating in acquiring a Chinese language education. Um, so why, why um, is this all important? I think what it, it speaks to me uh, about um, and what I'd like to focus on if I ever do develop um, this paper beyond the current sort of headless chickenness of it uh, the ways in which uh, soft power uh, is articulated uh, and particularized uh, and the way in which it involves the agency of myriad actors from um, bombed out peasants uh, in poor rural areas of Cambodia uh, to Ritanese, uh, Sino-Cambodian Ritanese from Canada, from Australia and elsewhere to um, Taiwanese, Singaporean, Hong Kong, and other um, investors, missionaries, and people who are acting in their own independent capacity. So to turn now to some of the more recent scholarship on the way in which uh, this, this site of cultural sort of diplomacy of functions in uh, relations between China and Southeast Asia. In their recent article on Sino-Cambodian relations, Burgos and Sopal Ia define soft power as the application of China's expanding economy to trade, aid, and investment to achieve political ends. Burgos and Ia further contend that China is embarked on what they define as, I quote, cultural force feeding of Southeast Asian nations through its cultural diplomacy, which they define as, I quote, the use of cultural background to influence states and peoples in other locations. 
end of quote, and that this in Cambodia takes the form of, quote, cultural showcasing and the promotion of Chinese language. In this top-down analysis, what is emphasized is not the diffuse nature of soft power and the many varied agents, including principally non-state actors, whom can direct, um, who can, sorry, direct, inflect, generate, and in other ways influence the forms that soft power takes. Uh, rather, soft power is defined as having two structural forms in China's engagement in Southeast Asia, the first multilateral cooperation and the second bilateral cooperative agreements. It is presumably this mode of analysis that leads Burgos and Ea to the contentious conclusion that the multifaceted and complex resurgence of Chinese cultural identity in Cambodia since the early 1990s is simply the outcome of cultural carpetbagging on the part of the People's Republic of China. In their Asian survey article, these authors argue that China, I quote, spotted a golden opportunity to aggressively support a Chinese cultural revival, end of quotes, capitalizing on, quote, the near decimation of ancient Cambodian cultural heritage by the Khmer Rouge regime, end of quote. Um, in his study of China's engagement with Southeast Asia, David Shambao has emphasized China's increased engagement in the Southeast Asia region through multilateral institutions and its engagement of the periphery through a raft of diplomatic, multilateral and bilateral agreements that have shifted perceptions of China from a source of destabil destabilization to a, a stabilizing source. And we keep returning uh, in these meetups to the importance of, of perceptions, uh, of mutual perceptions. Um, so where once China exported Maoist ideology, uh, principally in the 60s uh, and 70s, um, and supported fifth columns among overseas Chinese, um, as was experienced uh, in Cambodia and other Southeast Asian nations, um, and saw the sort of the, the, the tagging of those uh, overseas Chinese communities as politically suspect. Um, and where China exported revolutions and weapons, uh, Shambo argues, it now exports goodwill and consumer durables to Southeast Asia. Shambo's analysis is interesting for its emphasis on the importance of norms and of soft power in this shift. Rather than tout a model of cultural force feeding, Shambo notes the appreciation by the Chinese government of the salience of soft power as reflected in efforts to popularize Chinese culture throughout the region. Shamboy points to more subtle planes for the transmission of soft power and implicitly emphasizes that soft power is precisely not easily contained along bilateral lines. And I think it's important to, to explore, um, you know, in, in this meeting uh, and exchange uh, of ideas uh, and, you know, research that we each have done and in thinking about uh, this relationship um, to always sort of think about it as something that is necessarily entangled in other relationships and not just not just purely as a, as a two-way um, thing. So um, he emphasizes this and points to the unprecedented spread. Thank you. That's great. Perfect. Of Chinese print media, television, um, again, uh, items that came up in this morning's uh, sort of keynote speech, um, music, food, and popular culture around Asia and the growth of Chinese tourism. Soft power has therefore buttressed multilateral institutional initiatives such as the ASEAN plus free talks, economic aid agreements, as a contributing factor to the substantial shift in regional perceptions of China from a domineering regional hegemon and powerful military threat to I quote, a good neighbor, a constructive partner, a careful listener, and a non-threatening regional power. Um, and so rather than focus on uh, China's sponsorship of language education in Southeast Asia, he considers uh, the training of future generations of intellectuals, technicians, and political elites in its universities and technical colleges, where students from Southeast Asia gain a grounding and exposure to Chinese language, society, culture, history, and politics. So just to give some statistics, uh, in China from Vietnam now, there are 3,487 students from Indonesia, 2,563 at uh, Chinese universities, Thailand, 1,554, um, and approximately 80% of the foreign students are enrolled in, in Chinese universities. Um, sorry, it, uh, of the students enrolled in Chinese universities came from Asia. And in that year, the US only sent 3,693 students to China. I'm sorry that I missed Thomas' panel. I'm sure this was sort of brought up earlier. Um, and so just from that, I want to shift into this push from the 1990s uh, by China to assert uh, Putonghua as a global language, a language that will eclipse uh, in uh, function and efficacy um, and commercial viability um, English. Um, so a, a central a policy, sorry, a central plank of this policy for projecting Chinese cultural power, which was articulated by Wang Meng, vice chairman of the Chinese Writers Association in 1997, is of course Mandarin and Chinese education. Um, 
and I go a, look, a little bit more in this longer paper at the ways in which um, uh, within Taiwan, these um, contests over what was the correct language uh, were worked out, uh, looking towards uh, also to the, the promotion of, of southern men and its regional ramifications beyond the electoral constituency in Taiwan uh, being uh, spoken by you know, wide numbers uh, of uh, Hokkien and Chinese uh, throughout Southeast Asia. Um, so these two policies, language and commerce, were probably conceived independently of each other. Um, that is, uh, in Taiwan with Li Denghui's Go South campaign launched in the mid-1990s, um, and were a response not to China's global campaign, I think, to promote Putonghua, but rather to local electoral constituencies. Um, and so there's this idea of a, a hub linking Fujian, Taiwan, and Hokkien communities across Southeast Asia. And I probably have two minutes left. Um, so I wanted just to show you, um, which is absolutely fine, and thank you for bearing with me. I just wanted to show you a few images to give you a sense of some of the sites and places where you know, I think soft power is articulated rather than in these sort of top-down cultural force-feeding models. And um, they might be of interest. I think probably Robert has seen them before, but they might be of interest in, if I can find the Microsoft PowerPoint. Yeah. And this is just from... Um, hmm. That one. Thank you very much. Thanks, Landry. Okay, so this is just. Um, so yeah. So I'll just start with that. Uh, this is one of a number of notices that you will see in Chinese language media uh, in Cambodia still, um, looking for lost families, missing relatives. Um, Quick quoted history. I wanted to show you the images. Um, some of the sources I've used in my research are Sino Khmer memoirs. Uh, there are a number of widely known uh, English language memoirs, also French language memoirs, less widely known Chinese ones. Um, and what I emphasized in, in this research that I did uh, in Cambodia uh, in the mid 90s was that, you know, this conflation of Chinese uh, as either, you know, wealthy. Uh, sort of evil business tycoons um, or, you know, as communists or whatever, they've gone through these various sort of perceptual shifts, uh, oftentimes uh, in sort of nationalist and other discourse. Um, really, you'll see many manifestations of um, very rural uh, participation, particularly in, this is a Hainan, Hainan pepper farming community that goes back centuries, uh, vestiges of abandoned graves, one minute, perfect. Um, learning Chinese in a Buddhist monastery. I mentioned a Buddhist monastery earlier. You could see uh, signs of this. These are sort of taken from fairly random samplings. That was in Phnom Penh, in Phnom Penh I think. Um, again, since, so here you'll see Chinese schools beginning again. This is in Cambodia, captioned at Southeast Asia. Um, that was, I think, a schoolroom in Siem Reap. What's interesting about that schoolroom, um, Tejo Association used as sort of grain storage and a military site um, through various occupations, uh, but being rehabilitated. This is in Krajeh, northern Cambodia. Uh, Camp Port 95, you'll, you'll see the um, landscape dotted with these graves. Chinese school in Siem Reap, I guess that's what the uh, photo that I wanted to end on, and just to give you a sense, because the um, girls are in that photo are not Sino-Cambodian, uh, they're Khmer, they're ethnic Khmer, and um, there are many reasons why ethnic Khmer were attending uh, schools um, in Cambodia. I see, I've got a question. Goes to Birmingham. Yeah, that's the end. Um, and one could argue that this is some sort of top-down aggrandizement of Chinese cultural supremacy. Uh, but actually, the bottom line is uh, that these uh, schools and temples were built up often painstakingly by local communities uh, with often overseas uh, Chinese Cambodian uh, investment uh, at a time when the infrastructure in Cambodia was very, very poor. Um, and here was an example of a sort of positive uh, intervention uh, in the Chinese cultural domain, um, but also very different in that uh, China um, embraced this very publicly and openly. Um, and I'm sorry to leave, you know, not, not paying sufficient attention to Taiwan in this uh, presentation because Taiwanese um, educators were very active, uh, Taiwanese commercial uh, also agents were very active in Cambodia until 1997 uh, when there was the closure of the Taiwanese representative office in Cambodia, uh, and uh, Hun, Hun Sen, still the current prime minister, declaring his open support for the One China policy. So you've got all of these things happening, but on the ground, uh, this is the picture. So I just wanted to get rid of my PowerPoint so I could <laughs> hand over to, uh, uh, to Antonia. And I'd like to thank Lan Zhe for her wonderful chairing and to offer my apologies to Antonia um, for not having sent her my paper 
in advance enough for her to be able to comment on it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Penny, and sorry for being so strict about the schedule. <laughs> Let's move on and welcome our discussion, Professor Zhao from Donghai Da Xue. Um, hi, um, is this session uh, supposed to end at 3.45? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. And then I will be you very have, quick. You, you have 15 have minutes. You have 15 minutes. Yeah. Still? Are you sure? Yeah. 20? Yeah. yeah. Mm, I will still be quick. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good news is, um, well, since I, uh, I didn't really have the time to read Professor Edwards' paper, and then, so I'll just mm -hmm. skip that one. And then she agreed to that. Mm. All right. So, um, yeah, I'll be really quick. Um, um, I, I don't really have a questions for um, um, uh, Professor Freeman and Professor Wheeler, but I do have some follow-up sort of follow-up suggestions or thoughts, uh, which I wish to share with them. So, um, well, first I will start with uh, Professor Freeman. First, as quite a few scholars have shown, international marriages have continued to be on the rise through East Asia to Southeast Asia. Similar to the case of Taiwan, previously more or less monoracial countries such as Japan and South Korea have witnessed a phenomenal change in demography, largely due to marital, um, marriage migration from fairly specific sending countries, including China and Southeast Asia. All these receiving countries share common social-cultural features, such as a relatively developed economic base with a specialty in foreign trade, and increasing dichotomized or stratified class relations owing to the ongoing change in the global market, and strong Confucian patrilineal and or patriarchal tradition, as well as profound transformation in gender relations and in particular expressions of womanhood in spite of this patrilineal tradition and ideology in recent years. All these features may contribute directly or indirectly to the rapidly changing aspects in this country's demography, such as ultra low fertility, delayed marriage, and spectacular increase in divorce rates, which in turn may also lead to the rise of the type of transnational marriage as we now understand. Well, that is to say, there might be other forces at work in constructing cross-strait marriage along with that of maintaining and um, um, seemingly endangered state uh, in the face of a socialist threats and the racial um, cultural degeneration as a thought to be embodied by mainland <coughs> rights. Well, in other words, I'm here borrowing Professor Wheeler's conceptual framework and asking similar questions about how broader global influences may have and or will possibly take effects on both marital intimacies and the state regulations. Well, I do understand that this uh, trajectory of thinking is beyond the scope of this paper, and yet I'm sure that given Professor Freeman's long-term engagement in this research project, and she may have already um, had a thoughts on these issues. Um, second, my second point is, to my mind, Professor Freeman's case analysis of the 2009 promotional film produced by the Mainland Affairs Council, Council is especially illuminating, and it's quite sad that she didn't really have the time to talk about that in today's presentation. Um, so um, I really urge you to read the whole paper because that part, to my mind, as I said, is really quite interesting. So um, the um, behind the scene uh, stories highlight the fact that actors in close street marriage, in particular mainland brides, rather than their Taiwanese husbands for some reason, can muster up tremendous social agency in building up extensive, incorporative, and unconventional, and as well as creative kinship networks whose moral nature, what that is, the need to care for often unknown and unrelated others, 
is, however, incomprehensible or even invisible to a state that is managing by all possible means to reduce them into the so-called caretaking dependence. Ironically, this may also highlight the fact that the state's tremendous efforts in producing and legitimizing the model of desert or desirable marriage migrants are in essence phantasmatic and highly possibly doomed to fail or have already failed. To go further from here, I'm wondering if Professor Freeman would be interested in taking issues with uh, politics of caring um, and um, unconventional ethics of kinship in her future work, or um, has she um, actually been working on that? And actually, all these themes, um, well, that is, um, all these topics like the politics of caring and unconventional ethics of kinships are um, uh, emerging um, um, uh, subjects uh, in the field of anthropology. And since we're all anthropologists here, so I, I'll just um, um, mention that in, um, um, here. Well, actually, I thought very few of them, I mean, in the audience, um, are in, uh, in the field of anthropology, right? No. No, I suppose most of you are social, um, I'm sorry, political scientists, right? No, no? <laughs> not either. <laughs> Historians, I'm just curious, <laughs> because I'm just curious about the composition of the field of China studies in the States or as represented by this conference. So I'm just asking. Right? Uh, okay, um, my um, 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 last comment um, 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 is that, um, over the years I've been working um, on, on the um, same um, uh, subject, and the people have uh, constantly uh, asked me this question, that is, uh, um, why do you uh, intentionally or unintentionally uh, downplay the role played by the Taiwanese spouses? Taiwanese husbands, you know, what are the voices uh, of them, right? And so now I'm just throwing <laughs> this question to Sarah. I'm curious about what your answer would be. Okay, now I'm just um, uh, move on to Professor Wheeler. And last night I told Professor Wheeler that uh, I know nothing about religion, and he said he was doubly relieved. And <laughs> <laughs> well, so am I. So, um, well, <laughs> well, given my true ignorance uh, in this field, and um, so you have to bear with my possibly stunningly stupid comments. <laughs> okay, so my first um, question is, um, well, I'm really um, interested in uh, what Professor Weller says about the uncausal linkage between social contact and the political change, well, that is um, unification, um, as grounded in the fact that either traditional religion or Christianity is national by nature. Well, as far as I know, however, cross-strait religious activities have been appropriated frequently by governments on both sides to meet distinct political or economic needs. So I'm just curious about um, what uh, Professor Wheeler um, thinks about this. Well, that is how the government uh, uh, on both sides have tried to uh, uh, appropriate um, um, uh, religious um, activities um, across the Taiwan Street. And what really the effects of that, or probably no effects at all, I don't know. Okay, and then the second, my second comment is, well, even though the rights of um, non-profit organizations and non-governmental organizations is indeed a global phenomenon and has been considered generally by both the supranational organizations themselves and the scholars alike as one of the most prominent features of globalization. The forms of and the ways in which these organizations work may vary greatly from place to place. Hey, my computer is not moving. Oh, okay, it's moving now. 
good. Given the fact that the majority of MPOs and NGOs in Taiwan still maintain close relationship with the government and considering the often contentious relationship between NGOs and the government in China, um, well, I say, suggest we may need to reconsider the role the state can play in the face of globalization. So I'm, I'm also curious about how um, Professor Wheeler um, would think about that. And my third comment is, both political forces and the global globalization of uh, 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 global influences do not take effects evenly among population. Factors such as gender, class, race, and ethnicity, as well as regional differences, often play significant roles in constructing social agency in responding to these forces and influences as well. Mm. We actually can see quite a few examples throughout Professor Wheeler's paper, such as um, the active roles women play in religious conversion during the Cultural Revolution and uh, in Ciji's um, humanitarian campaigns in Taiwan as well. And uh, similarly, regional affinity um, obviously leads to the unique form of cross-trade mazu pilgrimage. So, um, I would be very interested to know how Professor Wheeler would conceptualize these effects with the globalization model uh, or modernity model and the model of modernity and he's proposing in, in the paper. Um, what, he, what he did uh, talk a bit about uh, regional affinity, right, you know, in the case of um, 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 religious pilgrimage. Um, but 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 you you don't really talk about gender at all, right? In in the paper, and so I'm just trying to put you and uh, Sarah to build up some kind of dialogue here. Okay, I'm done with my job. Oh, good. <laughs> Ten minutes. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Well, we have five minutes. Uh, Sarah, do you want to make a quick response? Or? Okay. Yeah, can uh, we just collect some questions? And yeah. We don't really have a lot of time. Oh, well, okay. let's open the floor for, I mean, for quick questions or clarifications. Anyone? Hmm? This probably, Sarah, you can. Okay. I just have one small question. Oh, okay, go ahead. Um, uh, I, I, sorry, <laughs> well, I, I appreciated everyone's discussions, but I have a, a question for Professor Friedman, and I'm, I'm doesn't really, I'm not sure if it factors into your research, although it's related, and my question is, uh, the children of cross straits marriages, do they see themselves as Taiwanese or Chinese? Do you have a question? So, uh, Sarah, why don't you okay. go to first? Okay. Um, thank you, Antonia, for very helpful comments. Let me, I'll quickly respond to your question first. Um, I, I'll be very frank and say I don't know um, in that um, the children I interacted with were too small, I think, to be able to uh, <laughs> clearly formulate a sense of identity. However, I will say um, I have a graduate student who uh, did dissertation research with Taiwanese, Taiwanese children um, growing up in China, attending school in China, some of whom had one Taiwanese and one mainland Chinese parent. And she's precisely interested in this question of identity and how um, young people identify as Taiwanese or Chinese and what sorts of aspects of their experience, familial background, educational environment, affects that process of, of identity formation. Um, I, I will say, I think on the part of bureaucrats in Taiwan, there is quite a lot of anxiety about how those children will identify themselves, especially when children are sent back to the mainland to be cared for by grandparents, aunts, and uncles, um, and fear that, that, that because they're not receiving a basic Taiwanese education, that um, they will not assimilate as well into Taiwanese society when they return um, and may not identify. So some of the concerns that are directed on, from certain quarters toward Chinese spouses, mothers in particular, 
can also be shifted under certain circumstances and directed towards the children as well. I think the basic assumption is that if the kids grow up in Taiwan and attend Taiwanese school, that that is where their primary identification will be. And therefore, there's quite a lot of emphasis on the part of bureaucrats that those children spend time in Taiwan, although they can't legislate that, although they try if they have the opportunity to. Um, uh, so just very briefly responding to Antonia's comments, thank you. They're all wonderful suggestions, places to go. Obviously, the larger global context is key here. Um, I have other work where I've dealt with that more squarely. I think the argument I'm trying to make here, though, is that um, precisely because of the relationship across the strait, that attitudes towards Chinese spouses get configured slightly differently than toward other kinds of foreign spouses in Taiwan. Um, and the fact that they are treated, um, that they are subject to completely different sets of laws and policies. Um, prior to the establishment of the immigration agency in 2001 by separate regulatory bodies as well, continuing the effect of the Mainland Affairs Council as well. So there's, a, there's already a, 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 a distinguishing that is made within Taiwan that makes it look slightly different from, say, South Korea or Japan, which does not distinguish among categories of marital immigrants in the same way. Um, so yes, I would agree that the similar kinds of demographic changes, population pressures, economic pressures are feeding this general trend in Taiwan. Um, but th there, I'm more interested in then where the case of Chinese spouses diverges from that general trend. The second point um, about unconventional ethics of kinship, politics of caring, I think is, is well taken. And um, it's something I'm still struggling to work through. But it's very interesting to me, those moments where there's a, a chafing, a point of uncomfortableness, because one model of um, aspiration or care is being articulated that conflicts very clearly with this other model. Right? And what model is prioritized in those contexts? Um, what's prioritized and legislated through law and policy? Um, and what gets articulated on the ground or in response to that model? And here, I mean, and not to blame, say, immigration bureaucrats. They are following in a very well-trodden international model that says marital immigrants in particular have to be evaluated for the authenticity of their union, right? The US has the policies. European countries have the same policies. Um, immigration law has been shown consistently across the board to um, have be inflected and informed by more traditional gender and family role expectations than domestic family law is. And we see this across the board if you look internationally comparatively in a variety of domains. But it's interesting how this gets, again, in this case, inflected with a kind of political um, inference that is different from responses, say, to Southeast Asian spouses. And I think that difference is worth pulling out and, and understanding further because I think it does point to this love-hate relationship, for lack of a better word, across the street. And I'll stop there. Thanks. Two minutes, I have. <laughs> uh, thank you, Antonio. Those were um, those stunningly were quite stupid, questions. thoughtful, and useful. <laughs> not stunningly stupid questions at all. Um, so let, I don't have time to even attempt to answer them properly. Let me just address them really quickly. So the first one was: What about government attempts to appropriate these cross straits uses of religion, or just re uses of religion on both sides? So yes, they're they're obviously is that it gets discussed a bit. So in the sense that um, government policy structures fit, uh, shape the kinds of religious developments that go on on the ground, it does get discussed a little bit in the written paper, but I, I chopped. That was one of many things I chopped for fitting into 20 minutes. Um, why is Christianity so booming in China and in Taiwan and never really got anywhere? It's Buddhism that's really booming. And that, I think, has a huge um, uh, amount to do with the specific government policies as they're put in place in the, in the two different places. But my basic feeling you hinted at, you sort of answered all the questions yourself, but you, know, you, you hinted at, which is the government is trying to manip manipulate this, but the real driving force is not either government in what's going on. The really most significant changes are going on in a different level. Uh, the second point was 
um, this whole NGO thing, yeah, it is a sort of globalization, but that, um, like any sort of diffusion theory, right? Globalization is just our current, well, in the 19th century, we would have called diffusion theory. It, it has to be received, right? The external things can be rejected or they can be received in very different kinds of ways. So what are the different kinds of ways? You gave the example of NGOs in Taiwan, which tend to be quite cooperative with the state. NGOs in China, not so much. Actually, I, I don't think that particular thing is true. I do think it's true of Taiwan. I think it's actually true of China also, it's just that the ones we hear about in the press are the relatively small minority that do great against the state, but the vast majority are not like that. I did a um, survey at one point of Chinese NGOs, and they said, I asked, what's your biggest problem? And they said, money. Well, just like NGOs everywhere in the world, that, that's their biggest problem. And I said, what, what would you most like? And they said, money from the state. <laughs> not money, but money from the state. That is, they were really happy to trade autonomy for cash. <laughs> right? Autonomy, that independence from the state was not their goal. And most NGOs, that's not their goal. Their goal is to manipulate the state, to get the state as a partner in whatever agenda they happen to have. So I, I don't think that specific thing is true. But the principle you were asking the question from, um, that these things can be received in very different ways, absolutely, I, I agree with you. And um, Maybe there's some way I can develop that better in the paper. Actually, your third question is sort of a version of that, too. It's just not by China versus Taiwan. It's by men versus women, or class, or age, or ethnicity, or region, or all, all the other ways in which reception can, can vary. Um, I could go on a long time about those things that I couldn't in 20 minutes, and I couldn't even in a chapter-length paper. The, the gender issue is really important. Um, there's this kind of rural pattern of Christianity in China, it's 80% women, 90% women, right? So you see it really, really clearly um, in that one. On the other hand, we get boss Christian Christianity in a place like Wenzhou, totally controlled by men. We get patterns in temple religion coming back where women seem to lead the way because it's politically safer for them to do that. And then men try to take over. And then weird stuff happens, like the women bring in Buddhist monks. They say, we're not a folk temple, we're a Buddhist temple. And they bring in monks to prevent the men from taking over. So there are all kinds of really interesting things going on there that are, uh, I think, beyond the scope of the paper. Regional, it's a huge thing, especially within China. Um, we have only the vaguest idea of regional variation of religion in China, except that we know it's really significant. Um, <laughs> so feel free to pitch in during the break. Uh, and age class, too. I mean, these, these are really obvious things. I think um, class I would have trouble actually addressing because I don't know enough, but I'm sure it's relevant. Um, but age is quite obviously relevant in these. So I think I have to stop. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for your participation. Okay. Um,